Welcome to Cleaning the Loop, Driving Consumer Clothing Circularity, a short series of six podcasts funded by the ESRC Impact Accelerator Fund, College of Social Sciences, University of Glasgow, and inspired by the contents and structure of my recent PhD thesis of the same name. Each podcast is designed to unpack the key learnings from the thesis by engaging in discussions with the research collaborators, cited scholars and participants. Podcast one begins by introducing the inspiration for the thesis and the research collaborators, followed by podcast two, examining the literature context of the PhD from academia, policy and industry reports. Podcast 3 discusses the theoretical lens which has borrowed from anthropology, marketing and industrial design theory. This is followed by Podcast 4 which unpacks methodology applied and the complexity and privilege of working with participants in qualitative research. Podcast 5 engages some of the consumer and industry participants from the research, addressing some of the key findings. Finally, Podcast 6 finishes the series by discussing how this research contributes and brings new knowledge to the field of consumer behaviour research, concluding with recommendations and future research projects that are evolving from the research. The podcast series is designed to appeal to academic, industry and policy audiences interested in learning about and advancing consumer clothing longevity within circular economic systems. The podcast series can be downloaded as audio podcasts and videos can be viewed on the University of Glasgow website. On the website, you can also view copies of photos, infographic images and props referred to within the film series. This is the first podcast in the series of six, and through a conversation with Professor Deirdre Shaw, lead advisor of the PhD, and Rob Harrison from The Ethical Consumer, the main collaborating organisation, we will unpack how the PhD rationale was created, how the collaborators came together, and ultimately why I wanted to undertake this PhD, and how my original proposal evolved throughout the PhD research journey. Welcome Deirdre and Rob. Thank you so much for taking me on this incredible journey. Thanks Lynn for the introduction. Do you know what to start? It'd be really lovely if you could tell us a little bit about the impetus for doing a PhD and how you came to this particular PhD. So thanks so much for that that question. Yeah, I think it um, feels so long ago now, but it was actually uh, about five years ago. And I, I had a, a policy role, a strategic role with uh, an organisation called Zero Waste Scotland, who worked closely with the Scottish Government on Scotland's uh, Making Things Last Circular Economy Strategy for Scotland. And I had a fantastic role as the textile uh, sector manager for Scotland to implement the circular economy. And as part of that role, I also worked on uh, the um, Love Your Clothes campaign, which was a UK consumer facing campaign. And through all of this work through several years, what I realised was uh, even although we were working closely with consumers, we were still at a strategy level, still a talking to consumers and not with consumers. And I also realised in the transition to the circular economy from a linear economy that consumers were still not part of the system. It was very much like in the linear economy, they're at the end of the system. In a circular economy, it still felt that the consumer was at the end. Mm -hmm. And I decided to, when I saw this amazing PhD advertised and I just thought, oh my goodness, that PhD was written for me. That's what I want to do. I want to really understand how we put the consumer at the centre of the circular economy and how we really research what that would look like if we take a circular economy from that perspective of the consumer as core um, to the circulation of product. Because even although uh, consumers are considered the, um, in a lot of cases, 
the are responsibilized for the issues around a uh, product what we see is that in market terms the market is providing to the consumer but then the consumer ends up with this incredible resource so even although a consumer doesn't want the product it is still um a resource whereas the conversation for so long in the linear economy has been about the disposal of waste and so in this idea of of circularity and circulating of product as resource the consumer is then absolutely critical and key to the center of a circular economy so i just wanted to ask you about uh the rationale for creating this phd what um Yes. What was your research journey in terms of why you decided to yeah. take this on? So this was an ESRC collaborative PhD. So um, for a number of years, I was working with the PhD programme at University of Glasgow. So quite aware of different funding opportunities for PhDs. And the collaborative call really does appeal to me because it offers an opportunity to bring research and practice together. And that's something that um, is really important to me in terms of my own research. Um, so this particular topic came about um, Kat Duffy and I, who's um, also one of the supervisors or was one of the supervisors on this project. We had been engaged in an intervention study with um, consumers. We were looking at how we could support them and be more sustainable in their clothing um, behaviour. So this topic came around um, out of that research, but also out of our kind of growing interest in the circular economy in terms of what was happening in the circular economy, a lot more conversations around circularity as a potential solution to many of the problems that we were facing. But the consumer, while present in this circular economy, conversation was just kind of there but not really understood and unpacked it's just what you were saying Lynn it's it's like the consumer's there and the assumption is that that it's all just going to work because we're putting this around it but we're not really understanding what consumers are doing so we're not embedding this in everyday practices of actual consumers so the project really came around um, out of our interest in clothing and the impacts clothing were having um, socially and um, on the environment. Also, um, people talking about the levels of anxiety they were experiencing in terms of overconsumption, um, alongside this growing interest in the circular economy and, and the consumer piece within that and really wanting to kind of unpack that consumer piece. And the collaborative award gives us the opportunity to do a piece of research that really is important in practice. And I think that, that, that that's a kind of critical element, is it, isn't it, that you're engaging in research that's actually, you know, not just interesting, but has the potential to be significant um, in terms of practice. So that's really, I guess, how we came to the topic. So I think, I guess, key across all of these activities is this kind of um, interrelationship between academic research and, and the work that ethical consumer do um, in practice. So, Rob, it'd be really interesting to hear your perspective in terms of, of this collaboration. You know, at Ethical Consumer, we run, among, one of the things that we do is we publish a, a consumer-facing magazine. And the um, I, there, are all, there are two issues that always sell out more than all the others, and it's always it's clothing and banking, which are really uh, people, uh, you know, really uh, struggle for what, what they I think uh, what they would call, you know, good guidance on trying to make decisions in this space, um, and so, so yeah, anything, anything with clothing in interests me, if you see what I mean, because I know we've got an audience that that uh, is super interested in that issue, um, and you know, I we were saying the other day that. Um, you know, 20 years, 30 years ago when we started out, there was a, a workers' rights for a massive concern in clothing uh, for, for consumers. It's it's moved a little bit more towards environmental stuff, particularly when people are looking at the uh, at carbon impact mm. uh, of the clothing sector, but, but all the other bits as well. So circularity is interesting and it is it's it's popular with companies because 
you know, uh, certainly some people go, well, that means that you can just keep on doing business as usual and pushing stuff out there. And you don't need to address actually deconsumption in any way. You don't need to look at the levels of consumption. We just need to keep it moving around really fast. And then we don't need to kind of get our heads around the idea of, of, you know, a sustainable economy is actually something that's a bit contracted from where we are now. So it's very popular uh, uh, in business discourse. But having said that, it's also... It is also popular with consumers who do understand it and who do want to make the right decisions and to take part and to get engaged in recycling and repairing and reusing and all that other stuff that they do. Um, and so it's a really interesting space, this one. And like all, um, and, and, and one of the things that Ethical Consumer does is, you know, we spend time with consumers and try and understand what's going on in their minds, often through, you know, sort of lots of it's social media these days. It wasn't always like that. Um, but um, there's... The, as Deirdre says, there's a kind of, anxiety isn't quite the right word, but people want to do the right thing, mm. I think. And and one of the things that we look at is is you know a, a big big surveys of thousands of people, and we all know that that certainly actions around um, reuse and recycling uh, are always majority uh, of interest. People, sixty seventy percent of people are always saying that they want to do this stuff. So actually, you know, and and it's so so we. Um, so we know that there's masses of interest in how in learning how to do the right thing. Um, so th this is why this is why this area was interesting for us, I guess. And I think that that just highlights as well the consumer piece within circularity, because already that complexity gets highlighted, doesn't it? So this idea, and I would completely agree with Rob, this has been one of my concerns about the circular economy, the idea that, oh, it's okay, we can keep doing what we're doing because now it's circular and we can make it circular when with without the need to reduce, we need to reduce ultimately. <laughs> <laughs> um, levels of consumption. So already within that, the cons for the consumer within that circular economy, we have that reduction alongside the need to to circulate. So there's that I guess the reprocessing parts of a circular economy, isn't there? But there's the longevity part of things circulating for as long as possible prior to a reprocessing part. Yeah, absolutely, and I think that's what really interests me and excites me about the circular economy because I have come from that industry perspective mm. and I am really interested in the consumer and I think it's about um, cycles of use and there is in the transition from this mass linear consumption society we will be in transition and we have to work out what industrial circular processing systems um can work for us at the same time as reducing consumption. Mm -hmm. And so what I'm interested in within those industrial systems is how we get maximum output from post-consumer product, whether that's, well, I'm particularly interested and passionate about clothing, but when I think about all, I suppose in my original training as a designer, when I think about all ma material streams, I think about how do we maximise um, the the material in a in a closed loop, whether it's an industrial system or a um, holistic system, and throughout my, I mean, I've been working in the space of the circular economy since twenty thirteen, and every single time that I did an event or presented at something, right from the early days, it's always been about. But are you just encouraging more consumption? Are you just encouraging business as usual in a different shape? And and I think perhaps it was the design opportunity. I never saw it like that. I always saw it as the opportunity to create new systems that reduce consumption. And I think when we look at the pure ethos of the early days from, uh, from the German government's reports from the early 1980s, from uh, Walter Stahl, uh, in, right up from the 70s till now, it's all about reducing consumption through industrial and holistic 
uh, loops. And we see that in the Ellen MacArthur Foundation in the Definitive Butterfly, that in the right we have a blue industrial loop and on the left we have a green regenerative root. root, <laughs> and uh, that, But within those, it is about slow and fast cycles. But that's where we have to really address changing business as usual. And where does a fast cycle of um, post-consumer material work and where does a slow cycle work? And that's why, from a consumer perspective, we really need to understand what's going on in the lived experience, what's going on in the life cycle. When we think about our daily life cycle, we have slow and fast cycles of experience, slow and fast cycles of use. Um, thinking about uh, every single activity. If we think about sleep, sleep being a slow process, a long process, eating being a fast process, um, clothing, the different elements of clothing we need throughout a, a day. Yes, generally it's one outfit, but you might have several things going on in the day. You start your day going to work, then you do an activity after work, and then in the evening you go to a social event. Some of us, yep, just one outfit for all of it. Others, um, three different outfits. And within that, we have the family unit. And within the family unit, we have different levels of um, age and life cycle. So all of these life cycles uh are an opportunity. I see them as an opportunity to understand what's going on there and to then have the opportunity to say, okay, there is a part of life that we can benefit from creating a system in a fast cycle that is still going to be regenerative, that is still going to um, enable us to capture resources. Whereas in a slow cycle, it's a different um it's a different part of the lived experience and that's what i'm really interested in and really interested not for that challenge of challenging industry from a design perspective to really create these opportunities and to say yes it can't be business as usual but there is a fantastic opportunity to create these industrial cycles that service society yeah, no, I mean, I, I just, I was reminded, I mean, I, you know, because that discussion about circularity, isn't it? It's more complicated than simply, you know, a piece of fast fashion gets worn a few times, gets thrown in the bin and comes melted down and <laughs> respun and comes back as something else. And, and I think that came out in your work, didn't it? Because there are lots of other circles that happen within it, like when, you know, items are handed on to your younger siblings or they're swapped in clothes swap parties or about how how yeah how circulation can happen outside of just big industrial cycles yeah i think you're right rob i think that's what was really um interesting and exciting about consumers was in the research when in, i was engaging with consumers they were interested they were interested and i think because uh the type of consumers that um the sample, sorry, the sample of consumers that engaged in the research are what the literature tells us, educated middle class consumers. But also what that showed us was that not only were they interested in reusing textile in, in a slow way in the home, but they were also really interested in the industrial processing and they understood uh, that there were opportunities. Some, a lot, many of the participants understood that there were opportunities for industrial processing, but they didn't know enough about it. And they were frustrated that they didn't know enough. They wanted to know more. They weren't really sure where to go. And, and also, consumers don't have time to go and read lots of technical documents. And if I, if I dispose of um, an old raggy t-shirt in this way, yeah, it might get made into industrial rags they say maybe we've heard about that but what else is possible and what does that mean for this particular garment rather than that garment and i think that real curiosity of the consumer uh was was really um unexpected in a way and also really demonstrated the opportunity to 
engage consumers in a new way and to really work on that puzzle of, yeah, how do we inform consumers? How do we share this information? How do we make sure it's not greenwashing? How do we get them on, uh, how do we give them the information that will help um, within a space and time that they can manage? And uh, I think that's a, a key part of why this research was important, was in terms of how we understand what consumers know, what they don't know, and what they want to know. And uh, that always reminds me of, uh, of Deirdre, of you, and, and the very first in terms of learning to be an academic, and your mantra of reminding me always, what do we know, what do we not know, and what do we need mm -hmm. to find out? And uh, I think it took me ages to to get my head around that. But once I did, I thought, yeah, that's absolutely where you find your gap. But then I also thought, yeah, that's that's mirroring what I'm learning about consumers. So I think I think what's I mean, I was a um, um, signed up member of the ethical consumer before uh, I took on the, the PhD. And I think I remember seeing it advertised and being really excited because I knew how valuable it was for me as a consumer. It was a kind of go to, I'm not saying Rob, I read it cover to cover, but I did go to it as a reference document at least once a month, you know, or, or even more than that to check things and to fact check. And also, particularly more when I get into the circular economy, also thinking, where's the perspective here? What's, where does ethical, sustainable and circularity align? And so, um, yeah, so it's also, I think on this research journey, it's about learning what we can about consumer behaviour and consumer lived experience, but to give that back to consumer I think that's what I, that was a key learning for me. And I think one of the things that you highlighted, Lynn, as well, is about circular economy as a as a system. So yes, you're looking at clothing, but it could cut across mm. other um, sectors as well. And, you know, in my research, and obviously with ethical consumer, we're interested in ethical consumption more generally, you know, across the piece. Um, but there is, as Rob said, something particular about clothing <laughs> um, and, and people's interest in clothing and um, discussion around clothing and and a lot of the uncertainty about what to do with that. Um, so what? So while we um, advertised and put together a PhD which was about circularity, consumer and clothing, that's still a wide open space. Um, and it would be nice to hear a bit more about how you took that topic um, and drove that forward in terms of the, the you know, how you created and, and moulded that PhD when you came into the post. Thanks, Deirdre. Yeah, I think I, I was just thinking back to the beginning, uh, the introduction, and what I didn't say was about, I was talking about my professional experience, but I didn't mention a key impetus was my personal experience and as a consumer and someone trained in textiles and fashion and really passionate about clothing I, I, a real frustration for me is when I look at the high street not only in uh, the the high street contemporary fashion market but in the charity retail market. I remember when I was a student 30 years ago, I could go charity shopping and pick up a gorgeous tweed vintage suit for £1.50. Now, what I see is what I call the grey tinge in the charity shop. And it's because over 60% of the clothing that we own is made from polyester. And so that 60% is what we're pushing on. And that leads to what I see as this really poor circulation of post-consumer clothing. And we seem to have become a society that's okay with that. We don't remember what it's like to have access to real quality clothing. Mm -hmm. We have new generations of uh, consumers who haven't experienced real fibres, real natural fibres next to their skin. And so an impetus for me was really to understand the consumer lived experience, to really engage in this and to look at the problem 
and the challenge, but also the opportunity in the whole. Yes, it's about circular economy. Yes, it's about circularity. And of course, we have these industrial symbiosis systems that are synonymous with the circular economy, recycled polymer, which tends to be from plastic bottles into clothing, although the technology is there for um, a closed loop clothing cycle. But that's not really it. That's not really what uh, that, as we said, Rob, is an industrial solution, but it's not, it doesn't get to the fabric of society. It doesn't get to what are we trying to do. And I think it's also, people are really interested in clothing, but they're not really, in, not necessarily interested in fashion. They're interested in the functionality, it might be about the performance of clothing. It might be about the aesthetic. It might be about the budgeting uh, economic perspective of how are they going to manage their wardrobe. But then we look at the family cycle and it goes back to that life cycle of um, what is clothing for? What's its function? What's it there to do for us? And it's become this um, commodity of we've just come to accept this vast wardrobe space. And um, I had the huge privilege at an early stage of my career to uh, work in international development in sub-Saharan Africa. And my colleagues and I, we had quite a sparse wardrobe because you didn't really have the space. It was a different climate. My colleagues uh, from the region perhaps only had a few garments in their wardrobe for economic reasons, for very different reasons. And it was really interesting reflecting on that experience of living in another culture and then thinking about the vast wardrobes that we have and the aesthetic and performance and functionality of that. And what is it that we're actually trying to achieve through clothing? And so this opportunity came along to just really help me work through how can how can we change that system? How can we really, I think it's, yeah, it, it's driven by frustration that I'm so frustrated that society um, and consumers have this acceptance of that's just how it is, this vast quantity of polymer in our lives, which on the other hand is a really incredible resource in terms of a waterproof um nylon recycled jacket or uh, water, yeah, waterproof clothing or polymer-based footwear, apparel that's, you know, hard wearing, then we can see, okay, yeah, maybe there is some value in this synthetic material, but it's the abundance and it's the fact that we haven't really given ourselves the time to step back and say, What's the life cycle systems that circular economy and circularity can support the facilitation of? We think about school uniforms. School uniforms are mainly polymer based, but we know that it's much better for children to have, or for all of us, to have a natural fibre next to our skin. But at the same time, a polymer is really robust. So polyester school clothing potentially has had a fantastic role in the economy of clothing and it lasts and we have this cycle but we have to then think okay but do we need a system where you have this natural fiber as the base layer and then how does that work and then what do we need from there and so in order to really unpack all of this thinking and align it to a circular economy learning from the consumer and with the consumer is critical. And I think a key aspect for us, Lyndon, which was great having you coming into that role, was not only those insights that you would have as a as an individual um, and consumer and citizen, um, was from your work in policy. So, yeah, OK, so we do have these school uniforms and they have longevity and they have the potential to circulate. But are they? And if they're not circulating, what are some of the barriers to that circulation? And I think th some of the insights as to what would be stopping that kind of closed loop, because I think we we did advertise this PhD as a closed loop. But actually what it came to as you took the research forward was cleaning the loop. And I mm -hmm. think that 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 aspect around um, 
contamination and dirt was something that, that we were unaware of from an academic perspective in terms of circularity and the consumer that you really brought to this research. Yeah, and I think it's, I think what was really interesting about that was because I was challenged on it quite a lot and challenged on it throughout the PhD, not from our, our team, but in discussing it in wider forums. And through that discussion, it was very much about, okay, okay, contamination is the industrial labelling. It's about contamination of the system. A consumer doesn't necessarily think about contamination, but from the from literature and from uh, the heritage of uh, pollution, dirt, contamination research, uh, we see that that what what it equates to with the consumer is issues related to hygiene and the stigma associated with the sharing of products related to hygiene and fear and um I think two aspects, sorry, the social element of the stigma of sharing product, of circulating product associated perhaps with previous generations of hand-me-downs. Um, I think in my research, I even refer to Dolly Parton, Coat of Many Colours, and how in that, in that song she's talking about being taunted and bullied at school because her mother made her a coat out of rags. And so thinking about circular economy and where we're at now and the idea of stigma being a barrier but in terms of content and so that that sort of um emotional fear whereas the physical fear that um dirt and and hygiene was a interesting point from the from the the literature because uh, it talked about hygiene without really unpacking it. What do we mean by hygiene? What is it that we're saying that the consumer is? I think for me, it's always like, um, I think the easiest one from household uh, recycling is always our packaging. How clean is our plastic packaging before we put it in the recycling? And how much does that matter? Um, I don't think we're clear in terms of technology, but. Uh, it's like what's the equivalent in clothing in terms of something that's uh, seen to be uh, stained or uh, um, in some way contaminated, but is actually has actually been laundered. And when we look closely or we have the opportunity to smell it, it actually smells fresh, clean, laundered. But observing it, it looks perhaps to have a hygiene issue. And where we take it now is, is going to be interesting and in how, how to feed that back to people, uh, which is, I guess is work we're engaged in now, isn't it? And I think that's really interesting from the ethical consumer point of view because your work uh, and thinking about how it's informed me as a consumer is always about how a brand the contaminants within that brand, the chemicals that the brand uses, the um, uh, processes that they use. As, so as well as the sort of human, um, like uh, forced labour, et cetera, that you really uncover, that uh, more recently the chemicals and the processing has been really interesting. And, and again, that was really interesting in my own research in terms of that um, awareness and sometimes lack of awareness with consumers about chemical interaction between, say, the skin and the garment, uh, whether it's a, a secondary product like um, a, a deodorant on the skin interacting between the skin and the garment, adding to a stain, like a sweat stain. But regardless of these different chemicals interacting, it still seems to come down to be the fault of the consumer that this stain occurred. And these are really interesting uh, ethical and philosophical questions to be explored. Yeah, and I agree. I mean, I suppose, you know, one of the things that ethical consumer does is we we kind of, we 
broke broke open, if you like, the notion that that the consumer is this rational economic actor that sits there and buys things that are the cheapest and most, you know, you know, is, is maximizing their their self interest at, at all at all times, and um, and so, um, but. But you know, having broken that open, if you like, and then looked inside and realised that actually, if you start to talk to people, they're actually, they're doing loads of other things like political consumption or ethical consumption or green stuff and re- all this all this kind of stuff. But when you when you break it open, they're not one thing either. They're they're very com- you know they're as uh, they're as complex as people are complex. Mm. So lots of people are coming at it in different ways, and so not only you know not only is it you know, an error to to talk about the consumer as a as a homogenous entity is a it's an error to talk about the ethical consumer as a homogenous entity or people who are trying to mm. do stuff because they're all mixed too and and a load of people here are trying to do one thing and a load of people here are doing another and they don't all necessarily always agree. Um, but you know, and, and I guess, but there's a degree to which you know how. The use of conversation, just talking about it, uh, effectively, you know, can help help solve problems mm. for individuals. You know, they're often, you know, it's, it's a common, you know, I tried to get this thing, but it didn't work. And can we try this thing? You know, my fair phone was rubbish, so I had to get another phone and all this kind of stuff. Well, new one is great, by the way. Sorry, another yes. brand, <laughs> another brand chucked in there. But um, so, 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 yeah, it's about it's about all those things. And all of, of course, all that came through in your research because it couldn't not, if you see what I mean. Yeah, I think what I found was, yeah, consumers are trying. They're trying their best. And yes, that was a small qualitative sample of 30 consumers. But in that whole sample, and I did extensive um, consumer recruitment, everybody was trying to do something. And they might not be... Uh, It wasn't a question in the research whether they were a subscriber to the ethical consumer or not, whether that was where they got their information. But everybody was really interested in what they could do. And that's potentially reflective maybe of the fact that most households, uh, well, at least half of the households had children young at school. And there was a real, I could tell there was a, and they talked about it, a real sort of family discussion about Uh, systems of um, circulating in the home and making it the norm that you would share uh, clothing between um, siblings, even brother to sister. sister, You know, there was no sort of um, barriers in terms of sharing in the home. And so there was that sense of um, consumers trying to do their best. But I think what's really important about research is that was a small sample in an area, uh, in a certain area of of um, Scotland. And I think what we really need to do now is widen out the research model and try and establish what's going on in other socioeconomic areas of 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 society to understand. Is this the norm? How do we support um, all consumers to, yeah, how do we work with all consumers? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's an interesting question because it's, it's it's changing all the time as well. If you ask them last year, it may, may be different this year. I was just talking to Deirdre about some research that we've just done, seeing the rate of buying secondhand has mm. exploded in the last 12 months. Masses of, uh, and we, we, you know, we're trying to unpick that and understand why, particularly around clothing. It's one of the biggest big growth areas. Is it a load of new phone apps that makes it easy for you to do it? Is it because everyone's skint because of cost of living? You know what 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 is driving this kind of stuff? But there's definitely um, yeah definitely change going on as well. So if you ask them, yeah, year, they could be in a different place. And you know we're where we are now. You know in in this kind of you know with multiple crises going on around us all the time, stuff can move really fast. I think that's a really interesting point about consumer competency. And I, I, that came up in terms of uh, people looking at, yeah, say, reselling. And I know myself, like I'm a dedicated eBayer, both as a seller and a buyer, but other platforms um, 
where I find a bit challenging. And I noticed that participants um, say in their diaries, they wrote sort of different evaluations of their experience of different uh, resale platforms, whatever, in terms of ease of use, um, regularity of use, flexibility of use, um, what they were getting back compared to postage to send out a parcel. Uh, but I think what I also learned from that is that it was a learning process and they didn't give up. And it was just like, okay, right, I've learned that when I sold that product uh, on a certain platform, I didn't factor in the postage. So I didn't get any return there. But now I know how it works. I'm going to try again next time. And so, yeah, I think that something, I suppose in terms of the theory and with consumers, that's really about consumers and labour, Deirdre. And, and we've talked a bit about this, about consumers as um, workers in uh our linear economy as well as the circular economy and where does that get positioned within a circular economy because I think it does ask consumers uh, or require consumers to take on a whole lot of new skills like being entrepreneurs. And I think it also just really highlights back to the issue again, isn't it, that we're not talking about homogenous groups so in that sense you need systems that accommodate different things that people want to do, their interests, what they're willing to do, what they can access in their local area, because that infrastructure part is is really important mm. as well. And then understanding, as Rob says, the rationale behind it, because much of the second hand is perhaps fueling fast levels of consumption. So it's those fast and slow cycles you mentioned as well, and they need different enablers. Mm. Um, and systems to support them as well. And I think also, Lynn, I mean, your focus was on disposal, wasn't it? And and, and going into to people's homes and actually understanding how they organise their disposal, then you find those multiple um, forms of disposal at play. So some, is it in the bin? Is it going to the resale? Is it going to the charity shop? So within one household, these different dimensions are there, but have different decision-making underpinning them. Absolutely. So, so it's a constant management. The consumer is constantly managing. And so I was only looking at one product stream clothes, mm -hmm. but that showed to me that the consumer is constantly managing what I'm calling the resource. So everything in the home is the resource. And so they are constantly managing it, evaluating, making those decisions. Do I keep this in circulation? Is this uh, good for me? Is this helpful for me? Is it helpful for my family? Is it helpful for my wider networks? Or do I need to get rid of it? And what was really interesting were the things that people say donated to charity and they said there was nothing wrong with it or they might have said, well, actually, the zip's given me a bit of hassle, but it's OK, I'm going to pass it on to charity. And I thought that was really interesting, the idea of something not being quite right for you, uh, but it was OK for someone else. And I often, I did wonder... Is it that they're saying it's okay for someone else or that they just want someone else to make the decision about whether it's okay or not? And so that idea of, uh, again, being in control of that whole decision-making process of being the, the manager, if you like, the manager of this product, of this material, of this resource, um, it's a huge responsibility and it goes back to, to why I wanted to take on the PhD because um, the consumer, whether they like it or not, has this responsibility, this responsabilization. And the, the thing is that there is very little support, very little support to, um, there are great opportunities, but where what are they leading to? And what is the end point? And uh, I think that was I, I, that is the key challenge for the consumer. And then that idea that if something ends up in the bin, the the element of um, mental contamination, that guilt of should I be putting this in the bin? I really don't know where it, where else to put it. And I have evaluated and I've had to think about this and it's definitely going in the bin, but that doesn't mean that I don't feel bad about it. So these um, 
experiences are really interesting and important. This is what I mean, uh, you know, and, and this is where we were going back, uh, going back to the beginning about how we, you know, you do this kind of research with the hope that something practical is going to come out of it, or many practical things could come out of it. Um, you know, and actually kind of re trying to use this to to say, don't feel guilty, everyone does it, it's fine, mm. or do because of this. So, you know, you can actually provide, you know, you can you, know, you can speak to the contractors who pick this stuff up, go, it's not a problem, it's fine. You know, and you relay this back to the, you know, consumers in a way that's useful to them and everyone feels better. They know how to do it. And I think, you know, we're we're in a, you know, we're in a new world where you require, you, you suddenly need to acquire all these skills about how to separate all this up into the lots of streams, but you don't know. And it, so it's helping people to do that and speaking to them in a language that means something to them, um, you know, is 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 potentially something that we can draw from yeah. this work, isn't it? But the, it means that businesses are putting out shed loads more information than they did, so that you have to understand all that and to reframe it and take it back to them. But also consumers are coming to it at lots of different stages mm -hmm. in their journeys. So we have all sorts of folk who, who take, you know, we have – uh, all, all our audiences are sometimes academics who who, are, who can understand this stuff on a, on a at a really high level. Sometimes they're sixteen year old kids out of school who are on Instagram, and that's where they're reading it. So we create we're taking the, all this this detail mm. here and trying to reframe it. Well, I look forward to um, yeah taking our journey forward and um, translating the research in for as wide an audience as possible. So, yeah, I look forward to future conversations. Thank you for listening and watching Cleaning the Loop, Driving Consumer Clothing Circularity, a podcast series produced by the Adam Smith Business School, University of Glasgow. If you would like to know more about my research or that of the scholars participating in the podcast series, please email me at lynn.wilson at glasgow.ac.uk. Thank you for listening and watching.